Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Serpinon. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy here at the University of New Orleans and the director of the Tocqueville Project on Democratic Ideals and Institutions. Today, I am thrilled that we have Erwin Chemerinsky speaking to us on some of the most recent Supreme Court decisions on, on uh, affirmative action and marriage equality. Before I introduce Dean Chemerinsky, I want to take a brief moment to thank some of the people that have made this talk possible today. First, I'd like to thank Mike Adler and his crew of media services that helped set up this room and put our talks online. Second, I'd like to thank the Koch Foundation and the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University that makes much of what we do at UNO in terms of the Tocqueville Project possible. In terms of this lecture, I'd also like to thank the law firm of Adams and Reese that made a very generous donation to the project and allowed us to put this lecture on today. Let me introduce our speaker, uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who is the Dean of the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Before coming to UC Irvine, he served as a professor of law at Duke University, the University of South Southern California, and DePaul University. Erwin is the author of numerous articles and six books on constitutional law. One of those books, A Constitutional Law Treatise, is the book that's used in many of our constitutional law classes in the law schools in the United States today. And so you could say that Erwin literally wrote the book on the study of constitutional law in the United States right now. Today he's talking with us about recent Supreme Court decisions in affirmative action and marriage equality. So please join me in welcoming to UNO, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you for the incredibly kind introduction. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's an amazing couple of years in the United States Supreme Court. During the week of last June 25th, the Supreme Court largely upheld the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The court largely struck down Arizona's restrictive immigration law, SB 1070. On October 10th, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments as to whether colleges and universities could continue to use race as a factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. Next Wednesday, the Supreme Court will hear all arguments as whether Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, a key civil rights statute to fight discrimination with regard to voting, is constitutional. In a little bit over a month, on March 26th and 27th, the Supreme Court will hear two cases as to whether there's a right to marriage equality for gays and lesbians in the United States. It is hard for me to think of any two years in the Supreme Court where there are not only so many blockbuster cases, but so many decisions that affect each of us, often in the most intimate and important aspects of our lives. What makes this particularly surprising is how few cases the Supreme Court is deciding each year. Last term, the Supreme Court decided 65 cases after briefing and oral argument. To put that in some context, for much of the 20th century, the Supreme Court was deciding over 200 cases a year. As recently as the 1980s, the court averaged over 160 cases a year. To go from 160 cases to last term's 65 decisions in just a couple of decades is truly dramatic. The decrease in the size of the Supreme Court's docket began when William Rehnquist was the Chief Justice. In his last term as Chief, October term 2004, the Supreme Court decided 85 cases. When John Roberts went before the Senate Judiciary Committee in the summer of 2005 for his confirmation hearings, he was asked about the smaller docket. He lamented it. He said that he thought the Supreme Court should be deciding at least 100 cases a year. He became Chief and the docket promptly got smaller. So for each of the couple of years prior to last term, the court decided 75 cases. Last term was 65. This year again, it'll be between 65 and 70 cases. This has enormous implications for the law. From a lawyer's perspective, it's much harder to get review granted in the Supreme Court. This year, there'll be about 10,000 petitions for review filed in the Supreme Court and the court's taking only 65 of those cases. More major legal issues go a longer time before being resolved. More conflicts among the circuits, the state courts, go a longer time before being settled. There is another, less noted, 
I think, pernicious aspect of the smaller docket. As the number of cases has gone down, the average length of Supreme Court opinions has gone up. I can show you a perfect inverse correlation. As the number of decisions decreases, the average length of opinions is measured by words per opinion and pages per opinion increases. Now, I'm not sure what's cause and what's effect. Is it that the Supreme Court is taking fewer cases because the justices want to write longer opinions? Or as I would guess, they're writing longer opinions precisely because they have fewer cases. One of the things that I get to do from time to time is speak at judges' conferences. And I was doing that recently and wanted to talk about the smaller docket. I was looking for a measure that the judges might relate to. I discovered that last year, for the entire term, John Roberts wrote 11 opinions. That includes his majority, his concurring, his dissenting opinions. For the entire year, Anthony Kennedy and Elena Kagan each wrote 12 opinions. And I said to these judges, who all have dockets in the hundreds, how would you like a year where you only write 11 or 12 opinions? Now, the result of this is that you have far longer opinions. So, for example, if you read the opinion last term in the Affordable Care Act case, it was 193 pages long. There were many decisions last year with opinions over 100 pages long. I've decided, decided I want to start a campaign. I can do, launch it here at the University of New Orleans. I think we should all get together in a word and page limits imposed on the United States Supreme Court. So I asked Chris what might be of most interest for me to talk about this afternoon, and he suggested discussing some of the matters that are before the Supreme Court right now awaiting decision. What makes this such an amazing term? And I want to talk about three cases, two involve race, one involves marriage equality, all of which we'll get the decisions in sometime between now and the end of June. The first of the cases was argued on October 10th. It's Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. It involves whether colleges and universities may continue to use race as one factor among many admission decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. In June 2003, in a case called Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court ruled that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. The Supreme Court said all students' learning is enhanced. All students are better prepared for the world if they're taught in a diverse classroom. And so the Supreme Court said college and universities cannot have a quota or a set-aside based on race, but they can use race as one factor among many in their admissions decisions. In 2004, the regents of the University of Texas realized that the University of Texas was less racially diverse than it had been in 1996. There were fewer African American students attending the University of Texas in 2004 than in 1996. There were fewer Latino students in the University of Texas in 2004 than in 1996 notwithstanding a significant increase in the Latino population in the state during this time. Texas had previously adopted a plan where it would take the top 10% of high schools throughout the state. Since Texas, like so many states, is racially segregated in many places, this would provide some racial diversity. But it obviously wasn't sufficient since 2004 levels of diversity were less than they were in 1996. So the regents of the University of Texas said they would take 75% of the entering class through the top 10% plan. And for the other 25%, they would do what was called a holistic review of each admissions file. For each student, they calculated an admission score. That was the sum of two other numbers. One number was called a personal achievement index. That was the applicant's grades and test scores. The other that was looked at was an academic achievement index. And this looked at six different factors. Among them were two essays in the application process that were graded, and also 
One of those factors was race or diversity more generally. And so the University of Texas felt it was doing exactly what the Supreme Court had prescribed in Grutter versus Bollinger. Race was one of many different factors in the admission process. Abigail Fisher applied to be admitted to the University of Texas at Austin in the fall of 2008 class, the class that was beginning then. She was denied admission. She came and attended Louisiana State University, from which she graduated in the spring of 2012. But she brought a lawsuit arguing that the consideration of race as a factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. She argued that this was impermissible. Now, in Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003, Justice Sandra O'Connor wrote the opinion for the court and she said that she thought that the court was resolving the issue of affirmative action in higher education for the next 25 years. Why then is this issue back before the Supreme Court a decade later? Well, there's an easy explanation for that. Sandra Day O'Connor was replaced by Samuel Alito. There have been other changes in the composition of the court, but they're not likely to matter very much. John Roberts has replaced William Rehnquist as Chief Justice. They have exactly the same view on the issue. They take the position that the Constitution requires colorblindedness and that therefore affirmative action is unconstitutional. Sonia Sotomayor replaced David Souter. Everyone expects that Justice Sotomayor will vote the same way as Justice Souter to allow affirmative action. Elena Kagan replaced John Paul Stevens. She's recused, disqualified from participating in this case because it had been in her office when she was Solicitor General of the United States. But even if she was participating, everyone thinks she would vote the same way that John Paul Stevens would have voted. The key is Samuel Alito doesn't see the issue at all the way Sandra Day O'Connor did. This morning I was looking on a website and with the Academy Awards being announced on Sunday night, I saw that what they did was for each Academy Award, they listed what should, who should win and who's likely to win. So I thought what I'd do in talking about these cases, since it's the week of the Oscars, is talk about what I think the Supreme Court should do and what I think the Supreme Court will do. What I think the Supreme Court should do is reaffirm Grutter versus Bollinger and say, as the Supreme Court has said for the last more than quarter century, diversity in the classroom is a compelling interest and that college universities can continue to use race as a factor in admissions decisions. I've been a professor now for 33 years. I've taught courses like constitutional law and criminal procedure in classes that are almost all white and in classes with a significant number of minority students. The education of all students is different when it's a diverse classroom. When I talk about things in a criminal procedure class, about being stopped for driving while black or driving while brown, it is a different learning experience from the students when they hear of their classmates having been stopped by police simply for their skin color. When I talk about things like affirmative action in my constitutional law class, it's different. When I think of my law students, they are going to go and have to serve a very racially diverse society. They are not prepared for it unless they interact with people from very diverse backgrounds while they're students. The Supreme Court said this in the context of medical school in 1978 in Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. How can we train doctors to serve a racially diverse group of patients if they don't have interaction with those who are racially diverse while they're in medical school? The idea that diversity matters in the classroom is not a new one. It's always been easier to get into Harvard or Yale if you're from Montana or Wyoming than if you're Boston or New York City because these schools recognize that geographic diversity matters. I taught for many years at the University of Southern California. My guess is that the football players there on average have lower grades and test scores than the other students. Or, As was mentioned, I taught at Duke before my current position. My guess is that the basketball players there probably have lower grades and test scores than the average student. That's because other things are appreciated besides just grades and test scores. We're not talking about schools taking those who are not qualified. It's from among those who are qualified, choosing based on many different factors. That's what the Supreme Court said in Bakke. That's what the Supreme Court said in Grutter.
because of the legacy of discrimination in this country, because of continuing discrimination in this country, there simply is not going to be much racial diversity unless there's the ability to pursue affirmative action in race-conscious admissions policies. Let me give you some statistics here. In 2011, the last year for which statistics are available, in the entire United States, there were 47 African-American students applying for law school with an LSAT above 165 and a GPA above 3.5. And if you're not familiar with how the LSAT is scored, at my law school, the median LSAT is 167. At a school like Berkeley, it's 169. At NYU, it's 170. At Yale, it's about 172. There are only 47 African-American students in the entire country with LSATs above 165 and GPAs above 3.5. Harvard and Yale could take all of those students. The University of California Davis Medical School estimated that without some form of affirmative action, they would average less than one African-American or Latino student in the entering class per year. When California voters passed an initiative in 1996, Proposition 209, to ban affirmative action, there was a precipitous drop in the number of African-American and Latino students at the University of California schools. Why even today do we see this? Well, statistics indicate that on average, about 20% less is spent on a black child's elementary and secondary schooling than an average white child's elementary and secondary schooling. Until someday we equalize educational opportunity, we're not going to remedy the history of past discrimination. We're not going to remedy current discrimination. And so affirmative action is necessary. So that's what I think the Supreme Court should do in Fisher versus University of Texas Austin. What will it do? I think the Supreme Court is going to significantly limit the ability of colleges and universities to engage in affirmative action, maybe overruling Grutter and prohibiting all affirmative action, at least by public colleges and universities. There's no doubt that there are four votes on the Supreme Court to overrule Grutter and to end all affirmative action programs. Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and Justice Alito. In fact, in June of 2007, in a case called Parents Involved in Community Schools for Seattle School District No. 1, Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion for the court saying that the Constitution requires colorblindness, that the government can't use race as a factor in admissions decision. That case involved both Seattle and Louisville public schools that used race as one factor in assigning students to schools. These four justices said, any consideration of race is unconstitutional. That means that the continuation of affirmative action in any form in the United States depends on Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the Supreme Court in 1987. In the now almost 26 years that he's been a justice, he has never once voted to uphold any affirmative action program in any context, not in education, not in employment, not in contracting. And so that's why I feel to a pretty good degree of certainty that the Supreme Court is going to greatly narrow, if not overrule entirely, Grutter versus Bollinger and either completely or substantially limit affirmative action. It's going to have a devastating effect on diversity, especially to lead college universities across the country. Second case I want to talk about is also about race. It's a case that will be argued next Wednesday in the Supreme Court. It's a case called Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder. You're sure to read a lot about it in the media next week. There was a front page story in the New York Times about it on Monday of this week. I think that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is one of the most important statutes adopted in my lifetime. It has two key provisions. One is Section 2 of the Act. It prohibits state and local governments from engaging in any practices with regard to elections that would have the effect of disadvantaging minority voters. And so state and local governments can't draw election districts in a way that disenfranchise or disadvantage minority voters. State and local governments can't impose requirements for voting if there's a discriminatory effect against African Americans and Latinos. And if a local government does so, state government does so, they can be sued in court, and the court can stop it. But Congress realized that wouldn't be good enough. Litigation takes 
a great deal of time and effort. Congress knew from history that especially southern states would keep inventing new ways of disenfranchising minority voters. So Congress added in 1965 Section 5 of the Act. It says, as to jurisdictions which have a history of race discrimination in voting, they can change their election systems only if they get pre-approval, pre-clearance from either the Attorney General of the United States or from a three-judge federal district court. The Supreme Court immediately upheld this as constitutional. A case called South Carolina versus Katzenbach, speaking of the blight of racial discrimination in voting. The law expired a few times, and each time Congress reenacted it, each time the Supreme Court upheld it. In 2006, the law expired again. Congress held 11 months of hearings, 12 different hearings between the House and Senate Judiciary Committee. The hearings filled 15,000 pages with regard to the record. And Congress then voted almost unanimously to extend the Voting Rights Act in Section 5 for another 25 years. The vote in the Senate was unanimous. It was 98 to nothing. The vote in the House of Representatives had only 30 voting not to extend the law. President George W. Bush signed the extension to law. Now the issue before the Supreme Court next week is whether Congress had the authority to extend the Voting Rights Act for another 25 years. Shelby County, Alabama has come to the Supreme Court and said, this is a tremendous intrusion onto state and local sovereignty. That a state or local government covered by Section 5 can't change its election practices without going to the Attorney General for approval. Shelby County has argued to the Supreme Court that this is no longer necessary. That the race discrimination in voting that existed in 1965 is a thing of the past and thus should be found to be a violation of states' rights exceeding the scope of Congress's power. What should the court do? What's the court likely to do? I think the court should do what it's done four times previously and uphold Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act as constitutional. The reality is that race discrimination in voting isn't a thing of the past. I can give you again the statistics here. There have been 650 instances between say, 1982 and 2006 during the prior use of this law in which the Attorney General stopped election practices on the ground that it would be racially discriminatory in voting. There were another 750 instances where courts found that there were discrimination in voting, and these 650 and 750 were all in jurisdictions covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Or another study found that if you look at the jurisdictions that are covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, they comprise 25% of the nation's populations. But 80% of all of the cases that have found race discrimination in voting have been in these jurisdictions it shows that there still is a need to continue. Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, that state and local governments still engage in practices that have a racially discriminatory effect, and that ending Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act will then give license to these practices that will disadvantage and disenfranchise minority voters. But what is the Supreme Court likely to do? I think the Supreme Court is going to rule 5 to 4 that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. In 2009, in Northwest Austin Municipal District versus Holder, Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion for the court where he expressed grave doubts about the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. He said that race discrimination in voting isn't today what it was in 1965. He talked about how intrusive Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is in terms of state sovereignty and their ability to make choices. And so I think that there will likely be now five votes, Robert Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, to declare Section 5 unconstitutional. And so if a state or local government engages in some new requirement with regard to voting, draws districts in a discriminatory way, the only way of stopping it will be a lawsuit, which is, again, always so expensive and so cumbersome. Third and final area I want to talk about concerns marriage equality. And these are the two cases to be argued in the Supreme Court March 26th and 27th of this year. 
One is United States versus Windsor. This involves Section 3 of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act says, for purposes of federal law and federal benefits, marriage has to be between a man and a woman. The other case is Hollingsworth versus Perry. It involves California's Proposition 8. In May of 2008, the California Supreme Court interpreted the California Constitution to create a right of marriage equality for gays and lesbians. In November of 2008, the voters in California passed Proposition 8. It amended the California Constitution to say in California, marriage has to be between a man and a woman. In October of 2012, the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York City declared unconstitutional Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. In February of 2012, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in Los Angeles declared Proposition 8 unconstitutional, and it's all before the Supreme Court. So, what should the Supreme Court do? What's the Supreme Court likely to do? I think that the Supreme Court should hold that gays and lesbians have the same right to marry that heterosexuals have always had. The Supreme Court has said that marriage is a fundamental right. Additionally, laws that prohibit same-sex marriage deny to gays and lesbians the ability to exercise this right. It's a violation of equal protection. I think the basic question that the Supreme Court has to answer is, is there any legitimate government interest in denying to gays and lesbians the ability to have all of the legal benefits that are conferred on married couples, to have all of the joys, to experience all of the disappointments of marriage that heterosexual couples have always been able to have. Well, look at the arguments that are made against marriage equality in the briefs that have been filed in the Supreme Court. One argument is that marriage has always been between a man and a woman. But that's a definition. It's not a constitutional argument. Until 1967, when the Supreme Court decided the aptly titled case Loving versus Virginia, almost every southern state had a law that prohibited interracial marriage. The fact that that had always been that way didn't mean that that's what the Constitution requires, and the court struck down the anti-miscegenation statutes. A second argument that's sometimes made, and it is the primary one being advanced in the Supreme Court in the briefs defending these laws, is that marriage is inherently about procreation. Well, there's many flaws with this argument. Never has the government required a heterosexual couple to show that they're capable of or desirous of having children in order to be able to get a marriage license. But even more fundamentally, what this argument misses is that gay and lesbian couples will have children whether or not they're able to marry. Gay couples will have children through surrogacy and adoption, lesbian couples through artificial insemination and adoption. And the question is whether or not the children of those couples are better off with married versus unmarried parents. If one accepts the traditional argument that marriage is a fundamental constitutional right because it promotes family stability, because it's good for children, then allowing marriage equality furthers the underlying goals of that constitutional right. Another argument that's made, especially in the press, is that allowing marriage equality for gays and lesbians will harm heterosexual marriage. I've never understood that argument. I've never understood how my marriage is any different, let alone any weaker, because a gay couple or a lesbian couple can also get married. I cannot think of anything more affirming of the institution of marriage in my generation than when Gavin Newsom, the mayor of San Francisco, briefly allowed same-sex marriage there. And if you remember on the news, there were pictures of same-sex couples holding hands and long lines standing in the rain. And so I don't see how that harms the institution of marriage. And so I think the Supreme Court should do what these other federal courts of appeals have done and say that the laws prohibiting marriage equality deny equal protection to gay and lesbian couples. What is the Supreme Court likely to do? Well, I think there's a real likelihood the Supreme Court is going to dismiss these cases on procedural grounds and not reach the constitutional issue. In both of these cases, the Supreme Court has asked for briefing and oral arguments on a procedural question. In the Windsor case, 
the Obama administration refuses to defend the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act in the Supreme Court. It's always the prerogative of the president to refuse to defend a federal law. The president takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. And throughout history, presidents have said that they would violate that oath if they defended a law they believed to be unconstitutional. And the Obama administration has said it will not defend the constitutionality of Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. The bipartisan leadership group of the House of Representatives voted three to two along partisan lines to intervene to defend the constitutionality of Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. And so the question before the Supreme Court is, if the president won't defend a federal law, then can one body of Congress, and more specifically, one political party that controls that body, come to court to defend it? The Supreme Court appointed as a friend of the court Harvard Law Professor Vicki Jackson to brief and argue this question. And about three weeks ago, Professor Jackson wrote a brief to the Supreme Court saying she believes that there's no ability of the court to decide the case because House Republicans lack standing to defend a law where the president won't do so. So there's a real chance the court will just dismiss the case on procedural grounds. There is a similar procedural problem with regard to Hollingsworth versus Perry the case about California's Prop 8. Four same-sex couples that wanted marriage licenses brought a lawsuit in federal district court in San Francisco. You might remember in the summer of 2010, federal judge Vaughn Walker held a trial. He declared Proposition 8 unconstitutional. He issued an injunction against the governor, the attorney general, the registrar of records from enforcing the law. The governor and the attorney general refused to appeal Judge Walker's ruling. They were the defendants in the lawsuit, but they refused to defend Prop 8. So the supporters of Proposition 8 intervened and appealed Judge Walker's ruling. The question is, if the governor and the attorney general of a state won't defend the law, can the supporters of an initiative appeal to defend the law? There are prior Supreme Court cases that indicate that the supporters of initiative don't have standing, don't have the legal authority to appeal if the governor and the attorney general won't do so. So this isn't the issue likely to get much coverage in the media when the matters are argued in the Supreme Court next month, but there's a real chance that the court will dismiss one or both of these cases on the procedural grounds. Now, assuming the Supreme Court gets over these procedural hurdles and decides the merits, I think what the Supreme Court will do is rule five to four, or maybe six to three, that the Defense of Marriage Act and Proposition 8 are unconstitutional. And I predict that Anthony Kennedy will write the opinion for the court. Why do I feel so strong about this prediction? I think that Anthony Kennedy has to decide, does he want to write the next Brown versus Board of Education, or does he want to write the next Plessy versus Ferguson? There's no doubt where history is going on this issue. In the last decade, 14 countries around the world have legalized marriage for gay and lesbian couples. This includes even some predominantly Catholic countries like Spain and Portugal. In the November elections, three states, Maryland, Maine, and Washington, had voters pass initiatives to amend their state constitutions to allow marriage equality for gays and lesbians. Voters in Minnesota rejected an initiative that would have amended the Constitution there to prohibit same-sex marriage. Opinion polls now show that well over half of all Americans favor marriage equality for gays and lesbians. Perhaps the more important statistic is that among voters under the age of 35, over 70% favor marriage equality for gays and lesbians. There's no doubt where history is going on the issue. Anthony Kennedy was a constitutional law professor in McGeorge Law School in Sacramento before going on the Supreme Court. He's mindful of how his opinions are going to be taught in the future. He doesn't want to write an opinion that regarded as anachronistic that's thought of with disdain. But if that doesn't persuade you, there have been two Supreme Court cases in all of American history advancing rights for gays and lesbians. Romer v. Evans in 1996 and Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. Romer v. Evans involved a Colorado initiative, Amendment 2, that repealed all laws in the state 
protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination and forbidding the enactment of new laws protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination. The Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional. Do you know who wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court saying it was impermissible discrimination based on sexual orientation? Anthony Kennedy. The other case was Lawrence versus Texas in 2003. It involved a Texas law that made it a crime for adults to engage in consensual, private homosexual activity. The Supreme Court declared this unconstitutional. In an eloquent opinion, the court said, if the right to privacy means anything, it's what consenting adults do in their bedroom. Do you know who wrote that opinion for the court? Anthony Kennedy. I think he's going to see his long-term legacy is advancing rights for gays and lesbians. This is his chance to write the Brown versus Board of Education for his generation. He's 76 years old. He knows that his years on the Supreme Court are not limitless. This is what he's likely to see is his long-term legacy. And so as you look at just these areas before the Supreme Court this term, affirmative action, voting rights, marriage equality, you can see it really is an amazing term. So I was told to talk 45 minutes, which I've now done, and then be glad to take your questions about this or anything else that's before the Supreme Court. Please. I have a question about... I'm going to get my water. I'll go back to the camera. <laughs> One thing, just if you ask questions, just speak loud enough so that the mics in the ceiling can pick it up. About trends, uh, it's my impression that as Congress has become more uh, polarized along party lines, that the court over the last few decades has become more polarized along ideological lines. I don't know if that's empirically true. And the other part of my question is, do you, do you see any signals that maybe it's becoming less ideologically polarized? And I'm thinking in particular of an interesting case I just read about, uh, I think involving the Fourth Amendment, that uh, guy who's police, the police were searching his apartment and he was detained a short ways away and it was like Breyer was on uh, one side with Alito and Thomas, I think, and then Scalia sided with the guy, with the rest of them. Is that an anomaly, or is it possible we might be seeing more splits that are not along ideological lines? Let me deal with each of those cases, the questions. As to the first question, I don't think that the Supreme Court is necessarily more ideologically polarized than it's been at different points in history. It's a different ideological composition. Let me talk about what makes it different. For the first time, at least in recent history, and maybe ever, the political party of the presidents who appointed the justices exactly corresponds with the ideology of the justices. So at this moment, the five conservative justices are Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, all appointed by Republican presidents. And the four liberal justices are Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, all appointed by Democratic presidents. That hasn't happened before. So, for example, John Paul Stevens and David Souter were part of the liberal branch of the Supreme Court, wing, but they had been appointed by Republican presidents, Gerald Ford and George H.W. Bush. Byron White was one of the most conservative justices during his time on the Supreme Court. He dissented in Roe versus Wade. He dissented in Miranda versus Arizona. And he was appointed by President Kennedy. So there is... It's easier to perceive the ideological split among the justices because they so correspond to the political parties of the presidents. And so I think we tend to see it more that way. Also, we used to have more swing justices, and now we're one swing justice. The reality is that Roberts, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito are as conservative as any justices who have been on the Supreme Court since the mid-1930s. And likewise, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and especially Ginsburg and Sotomayor, are as liberal as any justices or almost any justices have been on the Supreme Court. That leaves Anthony Kennedy as the swing justice. It's one swing justice. When the court's ideologically divided five to four, he tends to side with the conservatives about 70% of the time and the liberals about 30% of the time. Until Kennedy, until O'Connor left the court, there were two swing justices on the court. O'Connor and Kennedy, and either of them could be. And O'Connor was even more the swing justice than Kennedy was. I argued a case in the Supreme Court in 2005 
that involves a six-foot-high, three-foot-wide Ten Commandments monument that sits directly at the corner of the Texas State Capitol and the Texas Supreme Court, a case called Van Orden versus Perry. In writing my brief, in arguing to the justices, I thought that Justice O'Connor was going to be the swing justice. My brief was a shameless attempt to pander to Justice O'Connor. If I could have put Justice O'Connor's picture on the front of my brief, I would have done so. But there were two justices, either of whom were swing justices. Before that, when Justice Powell was on the court, well, he was a swing justice. Justice White sometimes was a swing justice. Justice O'Connor was a swing justice. Now we're at the point of one swing justice, and he doesn't swing all that much. He's more with the conservatives than the liberals. That intensifies the sense of a court that's politically polarized. Does that mean that every case comes out that way? No. Look at last term, where the court upheld the individual mandate in the Affordable Care Act, where Roberts wrote, joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, where the court struck down most of Arizona's restrictive immigration law, SB 1070. Kennedy wrote, joined by Roberts, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. So there is instances where the court doesn't follow ideological patterns. That said, if you think about the most hot-button issues, what are the issues that in our society most define who's liberal and who's conservative? Abortion rights. Right now on the Supreme Court, there's four votes to overrule Roe versus Wade. There's Kennedy who will vote to uphold any abortion regulation up to the point of a total prohibition. And four justices strongly committed to abortion rights. The court's ideologically divided. Gun rights. There have been only two Supreme Court cases in history interpreting the Second Amendment had a right of individuals to have guns. Both were 5-4, split along ideological lines. Campaign finance, 5-4, split along ideological lines. And I think when the court deals with race, like in the affirmative action case, like in the voting rights case, it will be 5-4, split along ideological lines. That doesn't mean in every case, and I can come up with examples like the Fourth Amendment case you mentioned, or another Fourth Amendment case this week, but I think overall, when it matters most, the issues that are most defined by ideology, this is a very ideologically divided court. Please. I'd like to ask you a question about the uh, Miller case that was decided in June of 2012 dealing with the uh, resentencing sure. of juveniles. And I know that there is an issue as to whether that particular decision should be applied in a retroactive Correct. fashion. And that, in fact, there was an article in the uh, Advocate, which is now the, the local paper here in New Orleans, since the time Picky Yoon doesn't come out every day. There was an article just this past Sunday, I believe, that talked about uh, this particular issue and how it's, it seems like there's going to be potentially different decisions coming from whether it be the Michigan Supreme Court. I know that this issue is coming, working its way up towards the Florida Supreme Court. And in Louisiana, we have a number of, of juveniles who would be potentially uh, affected one way or the other by this. And the, sure. the issue insofar as whether it should be applied in a retroactive fashion, what, what is, I know that sure. the Supreme Court was silent on that, but what is your view on that issue? Sure. The case is Miller versus Alabama. It held that it violates the Eighth Amendment, it's cruel and unusual punishment, to impose a mandatory sentence of life without parole for a homicide crime committed by a juvenile. To put this in a little bit of context, in 2005, in Roper versus Simmons, the Supreme Court said it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a death sentence for a crime committed by a juvenile. In 2010, in Graham versus Florida, the Supreme Court said it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a sentence of life without possibility of parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. Now, what makes Miller versus Alabama different than those is it doesn't say there can never be a sentence of life without parole for a murder committed by a juvenile. It just said there cannot be a mandatory sentence of life without parole for a homicide crime committed by a juvenile. It, in a companion case, Jackson versus Hobbs, both involved 14-year-olds who were convicted of murder and sentenced to life without parole for the crimes, and it was a mandatory sentence. The Supreme Court said there can't be a mandatory sentence. So now your question is, what about juveniles who were sentenced to life without parole in a mandatory fashion prior to when Miller versus Alabama came down? And this is the question of retroactivity. The Supreme Court has said that generally decisions about criminal procedure don't apply retroactively. 
So you mentioned just a moment ago a decision from Wednesday involving the Fourth Amendment of if somebody is a few blocks away from their house, can they be brought back to the house and detained there while well, the search is done? And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't bring them back if they're not already there. Um, that's not going to apply retroactively. That'll apply to the future, but if it was done to somebody in the past, it just isn't going to apply retroactively. Very little applies retroactively. In fact, you might have read in the newspaper, in 2010, the Supreme Court said, it's ineffective assistance of counsel if a lawyer doesn't advise a client about the immigration consequences of a guilty plea. That was somebody who was a long-term lawful resident in the United States and got caught for a relatively minor crime. And he said to his lawyer, if I plead guilty to this, does that mean I'm going to get deported? And the lawyer said, no, it's not going to mean that. He pled guilty, and promptly the government began deportation proceedings. The lawyer gave him bad advice. And the question that was decided by the Supreme Court just this week, in a case called Chidas versus United States, is does that apply retroactively? And the Supreme Court, 7-2, to two, said it doesn't apply retroactively. Only Ginsburg and Sotomayor were dissenting. Now, the Supreme Court has said that a decision about criminal procedure like we're talking about will apply retroactively in two circumstances. One, if it's what's called a watershed rule of criminal procedure. And the court says what that means is we could not have a fundamentally fair proceeding without it. Well, the court articulated this standard in 1989 for retroactivity. It has never since found anything to be a watershed rule of criminal procedure. The other is if the effect of the decision is to put something beyond the constitutional reach of the criminal law. So, imagine that a state has a law that prohibits certain things, as, uh, certain kinds of speech. And then the Supreme Court says that law violates the First Amendment. That would apply retroactively, because that's saying that this kind of behavior is constitutionally protected. The Constitution doesn't allow the government to punish it. That applies retroactively. And so the argument that's being made is that what's really going on here is the Supreme Court is saying it's beyond the constitutional reach of the law punish a juvenile with a mandatory sentence of life in prison for a homicide. And since it's beyond the reach of the law, that applies retroactively. The government is saying, no, this is really just a change in procedures. And changes in procedures don't apply retroactively. Why is this a change in procedure? Well, what's going to have to happen in the future if the government wants to get a sentence of life without parole for a homicide committed by a juvenile? It's going to have to go before a jury and convince the jury that such a sentence is appropriate. Just like if a prosecutor wants a death sentence, has to go before a jury and convince the jury that the sentence is appropriate. The state is saying, requiring that the jury make these findings is just a change in procedure. Changes in procedure don't apply retroactively. So is this a substantive change in the law that does apply retroactively, or a procedural change that doesn't apply retroactively? That's the issue, and I realize it's a technical issue, but that's what it's about. Other questions? Please. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, in the context of the president's uh, decision to not defend Doma, in the, the brief that you referenced, if there was any, uh, if there's been, if part of the discussion has been the president's responsibility to take care of the laws be faithfully executed, and how that plays out, I, I have no idea. Well, what the president says is that he takes an oath of office. The oath is to uphold the Constitution of the United States and that he would be inconsistent with that oath if he defended a law that he believed was unconstitutional. And so, he says, I take an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States. He says, I'm doing exactly what that requires in not defending an unconstitutional law. There are many instances through history where presidents refused to defend laws they believed to be unconstitutional in the Supreme Court. This isn't something that began with the United States versus Windsor and DOMA. So no one challenges that the president has the legal authority to refuse to defend a federal statute. The question is, if the president won't defend it, can Congress come in and defend it? Or more specifically here, can one house of Congress come in and defend it through its bipartisan leadership group? That's the question that the Supreme Court has. And there's no case exactly on point. There are some instances where the Supreme Court has let 
Congress as a body come in to defend a law when the president refused to. But there's no instance where one House of Congress has ever done so. Will the court allow it? And if they don't, then the case gets dismissed for lack of standing. Statute is unconstitutional, right? It, it couldn't be for another reason that he didn't want to defend the law. Because well, I, I was thinking within the context of the take care clause, I was thinking sure. that that would mean that he'd have some responsibility that might flow from that take care clause uh, to, to defend statutes if his reason for not wanting to defend them is not constitutionally based. This is a situation where the president says he believes it's unconstitutional. I think when you go to the non-constitutional area, there you get into... The prosecutors always have discretion about laws to enforce, what laws not to enforce. I mean, I'm sure it's true in Louisiana and New Orleans. There are a lot of silly laws on the books from the 19th century that aren't enforced. I mean, there was a, a commercial recently, a serious commercial, where they kept finding these silly, like, you can't take a bath except on Sunday afternoons, or, you know, things like that that, that, that were on the books. And prosecutors just choose not to enforce those laws. Um, there's a lot of federal laws on the book that prosecutors don't enforce. And it's always been said that prosecutors have prosecutorial discretion to decide what laws to enforce and what laws not to enforce. A prominent example of that was last June, President Obama announced that he would not enforce deportation laws against some non-citizens who are here illegally who are between the ages of 15 and ages of 30 who have achieved certain educational groups. This is the executive order version of the DREAM Act. And I think the president has the authority to say, I'm not going to enforce deportation laws because the president is in charge of all prosecutors in the executive branch of government. That's not based on a constitutional choice. It's based on the president's discretion as the person who's in charge of all prosecutions for the executive branch of government or all enforcement actions. So I think the president has the power to do that. But here it's much cleaner because the president in Windsor or the governor and the attorney general in Perry are saying, we believe this to be unconstitutional and we violate our oath of office to defend an unconstitutional law. Then the issue is, can somebody else come into court to defend it? And that's exactly what's before the Supreme Court. Please. I'm if you'd uh, be willing to come in on the, the Florida v. Harris um, case. I was kind of surprised sure. it was unanimous. And, they uh, just came down on Wednesday. Your, yeah, your thoughts. Um, what's involved here is that the police pulled over a motorist for having expired license plates. The motorist was ordered out of the car. Police always have the ability to do that. And the driver appeared impaired, intoxicated in some way. So the police called for a police dog to come. The dog's name was Aldo. And Aldo walked around the car, and when he got to the door handle of the passenger side, he gave the signal that dog sniffing, drug sniffing dogs do, that there were drugs in the car. And the police then opened up the car, and they found methamphetamines and the things that make methamphetamines, and they arrested Harris, the driver. And Harris moved to suppress the evidence of the search, saying that there wasn't sufficient basis for believing that the drug-sniffing dog was reliable. And the Florida Supreme Court ruled in favor of Harris. Um, Justice Barbara Parenti wrote the opinion for the Florida Supreme Court, and she said, a dog can't be cross-examined. She said, you can't bring the dog in to get testimony from the dog, so the prosecutor has to show how reliable this dog is. How has the dog been trained? When the dog gives these signals, how many are false positives? How accurate is the dog? And she said, only if the court has that can it say that the signal from the dog was a sufficient basis for probable cause to search the car. The Supreme Court on Wednesday unanimously reversed the Florida Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically said, prosecutors don't have to prove the reliability of the specific dog. A general showing of how the dogs are trained their overall reliability is sufficient. What's interesting to be on the lookout for is there was another case argued the same day as Florida versus Harris. They were both argued on October 31st, a case called Florida versus Chardin. It's also a drug-sniffing dog case. The dog's name here was Frankie. And what police did was they got a tip from a Crime Stoppers hotline that there was a marijuana growing operation going on in a house. A police officer with his drug-sniffing dog, Frankie, walked onto the front porch of the house. And when Frankie got there, Frankie gave the signal that drug-sniffing dogs do, that there was drugs nearby. 
The police used that as the basis for going and getting a warrant. They searched the house. They found the marijuana growing operation. The Florida Supreme Court ruled that that violated the Fourth Amendment. The issue in that case is, is the use of a drug-sniffing dog on somebody's front porch a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment? So should there have been a warrant in order to bring the dog onto the premises at all? From having read the transcript of their argument, I think the Supreme Court is going to come out the opposite way that it did in Harris. Um, now, the state of Florida says, this didn't enter the guy's house. This just went onto his front porch. We allow mail carriers onto the front porch. Jehovah's Witnesses go and solicit money on the front porch. Girl Scouts sell cookies by going onto the front porch. What's so bad about a police officer and a drug-sniffing dog? But I think what the Supreme Court's going to say, like what the Florida Supreme Court said, is that the house is a special place and that for the police to be searching for drugs on somebody's premises is a search and requires a warrant. There was a Supreme Court case a little over a decade ago called Kylo versus United States where the police suspected there was a marijuana growing operation in the house and they pointed a thermal imaging device at the house. Marijuana growing uses a lot of energy and so if you actually go online, you can see a picture of the house in Kylo, and it looks like a dark house with a bright light in the attic. The bright light was the energy that was coming from there. And the question was, was pointing the thermal imaging device at the house a search in itself so that a warrant was required? And the Supreme Court said yes in an opinion by Justice Scalia. And I think that's what the court's going to say in Jardin. So it's different than the Harris case you mentioned, because I think that motorists have always had much less protection than people in their homes do. And I think that's the distinction the court's going to draw. But interestingly, Harris and Jardin were argued on the same day. Harris came down this week. Jardin still hasn't been decided. Anything else? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.